Okay, well, um, today the topic is accelerating data in the cloud, and it's really about why Firebolt was started and, and like what we offer to companies and kind of why performance is important for both data engineers and for their for their uh, clientele. And we'll talk a little bit about who that clientele is. So I'll give a little history of cloud analytics. We'll talk about what it looks like in action, data in action, um, why Firebolt architecture is different. And then we'll talk a little bit about uh, some use cases, a customer facing analytics use case, operational analytics. And then we'll talk a little bit about indexing, which is kind of the, the primary thing that we do in Firebolt to, to accelerate workloads. And then we'll give a product demo. You actually see the product in, in use. We'll load some data, we'll run some queries. So, you know, when you, when you think about the history of cloud analytics in 2006, AWS sprung up with S3. Uh, it was really a game changer. I don't know if everybody understood it at that time. Um, in 2011 then, so I, is, I was actually working for the LDS Church for a little while in their data engineering. Well, I was in the BI team. We had a data engineering practice. It was really well kind of founded. People were talking earlier about uh, Utah Oracle Users Group, they, they were a big part of that. They had a very, very strong Ralph Kimball practice uh, there. And I had previously worked for a company called Corda that had been acquired by uh, Josh James, turned into Domo, and they brought me back. And, and really that was cloud. You know, I remember when I was actually working for the church, uh, one of the other engineers commented that they would never put their data in the cloud. They were burst had come over and asked, you know, could we, could we be, could we put our data into burst? And they're like, there's no way. So I went to Domo and suddenly we were trying to get everybody to put data into the cloud. And, you know, one of the first customers I had to go to and convince them to take their data out of Vertica on premise. So they had Hadoop feeding data into Vertica. And then I wanted them to pull it out, FTP it to me so that I could put it into MySQL running on RDS because there was so little in terms of you know, what was there, but, but we were getting data to the cloud. That was new. It was exciting. You had automatic updates to the software, you, you know, it was vendor managed. It was a totally different experience. And so, you know, while there were, were hiccups along the way, it was getting started. And I remember that fall, uh, BigQuery came out and we started playing with it and we were like, this is way too expensive to use as a, as an underlying, you know, as, as the data platform for Domo. And so, we, we looked at it though, we played with it and we, we kind of were thinking things. Now, you know, for those of you who know, BigQuery doesn't look anything really like it did back then. It's much more data warehouse friendly. Uh, back then it was really just a science experiment about running, running queries on, on big sets of data. And then the next year, Redshift released. And for those of you who knew, there was a company called ParExcel that had an on-premise data warehouse that actually turned into um, it actually turned into a product um, that I know Ancestry was using for a while. Uh, and, you know, it, it's, it's always interesting to kind of see where technology goes. But, you know, Amazon took that technology. They basically bought the technology without buying, the, without buying PowerXL, and they put it in the cloud. And so now suddenly you could spin up an instance in the cloud, but it wasn't really SaaS, right? Like Redshift isn't SaaS. Today they have a you know, a SaaS version with their RA3 nodes, but that's not really not really working the way they wanted. But but it was provisioned in the cloud and you provisioned yourself your hardware. And if you wanted to upgrade, it was a, you know, you had to spin up a new node, a new cluster and move your data. And it was a big headache. Now, what it did though, was it made it easy to deploy between BigQuery and Amazon Redshift. You suddenly could have your data in the cloud and, and solutions like Domo didn't need to rely on RDS. Um, interestingly enough, they, they ended up going with Vertica eventually in the cloud, but, but you know, those two were out there, they were kind of just getting started. And, and right around that time in 2012, a bunch of companies started. And I'm not gonna talk as much about when they started as when they released their products. So um, I was recruited by amazon.com. I actually packed up my family. We were living in Lehigh at the time, moved up to Seattle and actually was working for Amazon, not AWS, but Amazon is a big eat your own dog food company. So 
Amazon Redshift was in the process of becoming our data warehouse. And so I, you know, we, I spent a bunch of time moving data from Oracle and, and it was amazing because if you think about, you know, the role, I was a BI engineer by title, but data engineering was a huge part of my responsibility. So I, I would create, we had our own platform, uh, data net that we would use to, to basically create SQL statements that would be, that would push data. We would push data from our Oracle uh, Exadata EDW into Redshift so that we could do analysis. And where in Oracle, we could only do a week's worth of analysis. I could analyze a whole year. So the kind of my, my big accomplishment at Amazon in the 18 months that I was there, and I worked for the mobile shopping group, is I, I created a report that showed a year's worth of mobile behavior and shopping in general for certain customers and whether or not the mobile app actually drove users to spend more money on Amazon, which is the big question that Amazon's always asking, is how do we get users to spend more money? And, you know, customers, you know, very customer centric company loves their customers, but they want them to use their prop platform. We do things like analyze, does AIV, Amazon Instant Video, does it improve the, the you know, the selling, all those kind of things. We were doing all kinds of cross analysis that required huge volumes of data. And I, and, you know, to be honest, it was kind of embarrassing how much I had to dance around the data. Finally, we ran into a team that was using Hadoop. They could do seven years worth of analysis. And that was like, groundbreaking. And then, you know, knowing what that problem was, I was approached by a startup as I was living in Seattle and they were looking for a sales engineer. And it was this company called Snowflake. It was a really weird name. And I was like, I'm pretty happy at Amazon. But uh, the things they told, told me as I was talking to them really resonated with me because I was understanding this problem of like, how do we get, you know, five years worth of history to be able to analyze the data. And when I saw what Snowflake had done with the separation of storage and compute, and then I went down and I met their, their CEO was a guy who'd been the number two guy at Microsoft, Bob Muglia. He'd run their server and tools department and their founders were these French guys. Uh, I'd actually served an LDS mission to France. So I, I did like a French interview with them uh, a little bit. It was kind of broken French, but uh, it was fun. I got offered the job that night and I don't think I'd ever, you know, I flew down to San Francisco. I'm like, this is, this is weird. I like Amazon, but I joined Snowflake and they pushed me to join, actually pushed me to, to ignore a vest that I was going to get so that I could get additional stock to join Snowflake before they GA'd the product. Well, they announced what the product was in October of 2014 and they GA'd that product in 2015. And this was a new, you know, cloud data warehouse native for the cloud, kind of changed the game. Now, around the same time, a company called Databricks was releasing their hosted Spark. And, and obviously, those two companies are now very big. They're, they're in a little bit of a Twitter fight. We're going to talk about that a little later right now. But they, they launched about the same time. And what they offered in the cloud was separation of storage and compute. So suddenly, Hadoop you know, users that were dying on MapReduce that was never built for data analysis, right? It was built to solve a huge problem of indexing the internet. And because it could handle huge volumes of data, people were like, hey, let's give it huge volumes of data and see what happens. And it, was, it wasn't great. So Databricks and Spark and Snowflake with SQL said, hey, let's bring it to the cloud. Let's separate storage and compute and give that scalability and flexibility. And we all kind of know where Snowflake went. I spent five years there. It was an amazing journey. I built out the data ecosystem there. And, uh, you know, it was, it was a great ride. Ultimately, it brought me back to Utah because uh, at a certain point, the, the CRO asked me, hey, why are you living in Seattle still? You know, you could live anywhere. And I, you know, when you can live anywhere, you come to Utah, I guess. Hopefully, everybody agrees with that. But uh, anyway, the interesting thing was shortly after I joined Snowflake, uh, Azure, Microsoft jumped in. So suddenly, you know, you're looking at it, it's like, okay, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, and Snowflake. And we're competing head to head all the time. And we're running on their cloud, which was just, you know, unheard of in that sense. But, you know, the, the, the market continued to evolve and Snowflake came out with a feature and and it's not unique to Snowflake, but what, what people realized, you know, when we first put data in the cloud, people wanted to have their data secure. And they kept asking, is my data secure? Am I safe? Is it, you know, can I get my data in? And I promise, guys, I'm going to get more technical here. So 
if you're wondering, you know, you came for technical and you're getting a history lesson, but, but, you know, data sharing is a big thing. Now, suddenly, you know, I, the days of sending around thumb encrypted hard drives is, is over, right? Everybody's data in the cloud. So the first few years of data in the cloud was separating the data, making sure it was secure. Then it was, hey, how do I share this data with somebody who I want to share it with? And Snowflake has a particular model, Databricks, BigQuery has its own version of data sharing. Amazon has some data that's shared. So, so there's lots of ways to, to leverage this data, but the idea is now that data is becoming the new economy. There's an economy around data and these platforms are making it possible. And then a, a small company out of Philadelphia called Fishtown Analytics. I know Tristan Hart, Hardy really well, and they're, they're great people. Um, they, they were this little, little company that could in Philadelphia, a little consultancy, and they created this thing called DBT because they wanted to define the language for data engineering. And they did. And, you know, it's funny, when I started at Amazon, I got the title of BI engineer, and, and I worked with a lot of people who had the title of data engineer. And to be honest, they were kind of viewed as like lower level than a BI engineer because they, they were just pipeline people, data pipeline people. You know, what's interesting is with the rise of DBT, with the rise of DBT, you know, it really became data engineering is the thing, right? Like to get data ready, and that's why we're here in this data engineering meetup, right? is that dbt runs on top of these cloud platforms it gives you a language that's that's platform agnostic although it does have a lot of sql in it which obviously isn't necessarily agnostic as much as the vendors want it to be but dbt really moved it forward in a way and data engineering really took over and data engineering became you know the next data science now not to forget about what made data science sagemaker launched shortly after that and, and SageMaker was one of many. You have Data Robot. Locally, you had uh, Big Squid and a couple other companies that were trying to do things around AIML. And so, um, you know, MLOps, Joe mentioned he went to an MLOps meetup. And this is very much in the, the current talk right now is, you know, hey, ML, AI, what can we do? Now that we've got all this data, what can we do with it that's different? I want to do complex analysis. You know, my father actually became, he was an electrical engineer, became a SaaS engineer because uh, Chrysler, he worked for Chrysler, he was bringing in all this data from the machines the, in the factories, and they were using SaaS to analyze the data. And, you know, SaaS was such a specialized tool and finding a job with SaaS was, was hard. They wanted, you know, people with statistics majors, and now we're seeing all kinds of things. And, you know, economists and statistics majors are great value adds in these type of organizations, but obviously we've got to get the data into these organizations, into that. So personally, I had my ride at Snowflake. It was great. I was vested. I had an opportunity to move uh, elsewhere in the ecosystem, so I jumped and joined ThoughtSpot, driving search and AI-based data. And again, one of the things that ThoughtSpot had done back in 2012 when they founded, and the, the reason why I have them down here, is because that's when ThoughtSpot Cloud launched. I I joined in order to help launch ThoughtSpot Cloud. And what they realized, they had built their own data database, basically data warehouse, because none of the solutions, they did the same thing that I looked at when I was at Domo, and their response was to create their own. They created a tool called Falcon that was their database. Well, in 2018, they were struggling. Falcon didn't scale very well, and suddenly they were facing you know, organizations that had Snowflake or Databricks and wanted to be able to bring that data in. And so I came to ThoughtSpot. We created what, what's called Embrace, which is the ability to query Snowflake or Databricks or any of the other data platforms directly from their platform. And they moved away and they migrated. Well, the biggest problem at that point was Falcon was an in-memory database. And interestingly enough, like as we moved to cloud, the thing that everybody kind of forgot was speed. And, and Snowflake's fast. I'm not saying Snowflake's not not fast, but like the really fast databases. So you think, you know, 15 years ago, Teradata was tearing it up and Vertica came along and they made it so you could run really fast on huge sets of data, right? And and that's kind of where we are today. Firebolt started in, in about 2020. I joined then uh, this summer. And, and now I'm in Firebolt and excited to share that with you. But just sharing the journey of cloud analytics and kind of where we, 
where we are. So you see all the advancements that have been made in the last decade and, and where we're at. Now we're having a data explosion. Every company in every vertical has more data than they've ever had before. Most companies double their data volume every year, right? And it's coming faster and faster. IoT is generating data. And we've got varieties of data. We've got semi-structured data. We've got, you know, Snowflake just opened its unstructured data, you know. So, you know, all kinds of data everywhere. Now, now that this data is all available, everybody wants to launch these new apps on data, whether it's self-service data, things like ThoughtSpot. They just had their, you know, they announced a big round of funding and then they had their user conference. Very exciting stuff happened there. They doubled their valuation up to $4 billion. So self-service BI is a real thing. I remember back in 2009, I did a self-service BI evaluation at the LDS Church. We brought in the top Magic Quadrant vendors at the time. There's seven of them, and none of them really offered what we thought was self-service. We ended up staying with Business Objects, which was a fine solution at the time, but now we're seeing self-service you know, enhancements to things make it so that we can do operational data in real time. And, and really right time is what we're trying to do. And, and so many apps now have customer facing uh, data. And so why is this important? Um, it's because ultimately people want to get their data as fast as they can. And, and part of this now is data is code. So versioning all the practices, the best practices, you know, it's interesting that, you know, Oracle Data User Group is talking about Terraform and Git. Like, that's a huge thing, right? Like, we're all, we're all excited about how data as code is moving in, and, and that's where we're going. And the things that, that are out there that are making it hard is performance. So nobody wants to sit. A human does not want to sit and wait more than five seconds for a query. I almost, almost brought in a little spinning wheel as one of my one of my gifts, just to say, hey, how does this feel to get the spinning wheel? Uh, I, when I worked at Amazon, during the holiday rush, there'd been a time when the, the, the web page didn't load for five seconds for some users. And a, a senior VP in a meeting shortly after that counted to five in front of all of his direct reports and a bunch of other people, just to show them how slow that was. And that ultimately, like everything in the web requires real time. And when I say real time, I don't mean that the data is coming in in real time from the source, but that when you interact, when you click a button on a dashboard, it should refresh immediately, right? People don't want to wait for their data. I talk to customers and they say, yeah, I tell the BI guy what I want. And he goes in, in three days and he gets me the data. I was shocked when I got to Amazon that, you know, we'd go into a meeting with the VP and he'd ask for something. They'd say, we'll have that for you in a month. And part of that was that we had to build the data engineering pipeline to feed it, but but ultimately, like the data should be performant, both for ingest and for query. And then it, it, it you know the cost. Obviously, you can spin up in a you know an incredible amount of compute. I still remember I was at Domo and it was early days, and they said anything you need to spin up, spin up an EC2 node. And a month later, they sent out an email and said, "Stop spinning up EC2 nodes. You're, we're, we're spending way way too much money." Um, and so you know, obviously you got to control the cost and the way that you control the cost, you know, cloud costs, compute costs aren't going down, right? They're, they've been flat and, and yet we want these new analytics that require more and more compute and AI and ML, you know, definitely huge. You know, there's a reason the clouds are pushing them so hard is because they drive a ton of raw compute. So sometimes as a user, you know, I just get a little top gun at me and I, I feel the need the need for speed is, is, you know, people my age, you know, this is their movie. And then this is something that, that Firebolt posted to their, to their uh, social media channel. So I grabbed it. I don't know if you guys have been following on social media, the, the kind of the fight going on between Snowflake and Databricks. Databricks announced a, a world record in a particular benchmark. Snowflake took issue with that, with their, their, both their thinking and their representation of Snowflake, and they keep going back and forth. And so we at Firebolt are kind of enjoying watching the show. Um, but, but it does matter. Like, ultimately, it matters. And the reason it matters is these people. And, and I apologize. Sometimes when we work with uh, people who aren't native to America, just so you know, Firebolt was actually founded in Israel. Um, Tel Aviv is a very hot tech community. 
a lot of the companies shifting now to the Bay Area and Seattle from a technical perspective. Uh, we're a distributed company, so we have people all over the world. But I, I, I kind of took issue with this, and I didn't get a chance to get it replaced. But but you have analysts, which is essentially workers, data workers. This could be a data engineer. This could be a BI engineer. This could be an analyst. They're creating content. They're managing data. They're having to deal with all of this. And um, you know the uh, then we have the employees, and I, I say data workers. I say business decision makers, business users, right? They are the ones who want the data. So at Amazon, I served a bunch of product managers who were defining products like the Fire Phone, by the way, which you know was a disaster. In fact, the problem with the Fire Phone was they didn't. They came to me the week after it launched and said, "Hey, what metrics do we have on how people are using the Fire Phone?" And I said that. You know, you can't do that. But these employees could be product managers. It could be, you know, managers in general, right? And then customers. So, you know, think about all of the different apps that you log into on a daily basis that you want to see your metrics for, right? And and it's very hard to to for companies to expose those metrics in a secure way. But the cloud makes that possible. So. We, as data engineers, serve a wide variety of audiences, and those people don't want to wait for data. Number one, they don't want to wait for us. We used to talk about it at, at ThoughtSpot, how there are one tech worker who knows the data for 10 of these business users or employees. And you think about the, word, the backlogs that you have of requests for new analytics, new metrics, or tweaks to existing analytics. I remember I was creating a dashboard for a unit at the church, and it, I got brought into the project six months in, because the project had originally been designed to be six months, and they were, tell, they were calling the customer, the, the users, to tell them that it was going to be another six months. We were six months behind. Well, we delivered in three months. So a total of nine months, so we were behind, but we spent nine months building this dashboard. And within five minutes of looking at the dashboard, the managing director had six changes for me to make to the dashboard. And do you know how long it took me to make those changes? It took me months. And, and that's why it's important. That's why that need for speed exists. That's why we have to have the, the, you know, the data needs to be performing. So number one, embedded BI, I've talked a little bit about this. So building interactive charts and graphs within applications. We've got Verisk Analytics here in Utah that I know uses Snowflake and ThoughtSpot as a way to create embedded BI. And, and it's great. It's, it's a great way. We're going to walk through a use case in, in Firebolt that has that. Um, but again, you may have thousands of concurrent users. You don't want to have to tell a customer, hey, we're going to give you access, but only, only have a few of your people. Or if it's open on the internet, Think about your bank. How many things does your bank show you on a daily basis that are trends, that are charts? All those things, all these different organizations trying to feed data to their end users and wanting it to be fast because people are going to look at that as a representation of their product. Internal data. So internal users, when you've got cases like Clickstream, I would run queries. We had a two-hour query time limit at at Amazon, and anything no longer than that would get killed. Well, I would have to apply to the internal BI team for an exception for some of the reports that I needed to run because they couldn't get done in that under two hours. That's just ridiculous. Massive data volumes, complex calculations, and flexible data models you know, are, are making these queries slow. You've got application logs coming in now. You know, people want to understand their what's happening with their with their applications, with their data, with their users. They want to do a user 360, and and that just takes a tremendous amount of time. And the less flexible your architecture is, the the slower your queries run, the more you have to go to aggregation layers and different things like that. Data transformation. So we're here as data engineers, right? Data transformation is part of our job. And and you think about the the different workloads. You know, from MapReduce to Spark, and you know, Python's great. I love Python, but there are cases when Python is not needed, where you can use SQL to do in-database transforms and really accelerate. And those are places where 
where Firebolt really shines today. Uh, you know, building a data warehouse is a hard thing to do. And, you know, we're two years in at Firebolt. Uh, obviously, you have Snowflake and others that, are, you know, Red just been around now almost 10 years uh, and a lot of exciting things. But I want to run, run through these use cases. And then we're going to get our hands on the, 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 the technical meat, right? So because now that we see why it's important, we're going to get this. But the challenge for SimilarWeb, so SimilarWeb collects digital market intelligence about websites, who's using it. It's kind of an app Annie for the rest of the world. Uh, they're a European-based company, and they wanted to make personalized reports for each of their customers. But to, you know, personalizing across 200 terabytes is very hard because you've got to apply filters. And, and they kept getting requests for new and advanced analytics, and they just they couldn't meet the need, right? So they, they brought in Firebolt, they're bringing in they're using ELT instead of ETL. And, and you know, there's lots of reasons why ETL came into being. Uh, back then, data warehouses were the, the smallest system that you had. And, and space in the data warehouse was critical, right? You had to evaluate every data set that was going to go in. And, and doing transforms outside of the database just made sense. But as these databases have gotten scalable and storage is cheap, now you use ELT. And that's really what's there. Um, it's, you know, we can, we use semi-structured data. Firebolt actually has a, a fantastic solution around semi-structured data where we store it in arrays. And again, the, the, our engines, which we'll talk about in just a minute, cache the data so that as you interact with the data, it gets faster. And what they're doing now, they're able to deliver new analytics quickly and they're saving five times they spent five times more on their old system than they are on Firebolt. So uh, again, and we'll talk about a little bit about how they got there. Now, uh, AppsFlyer, and I hate to show benchmarks, so we're going to show this one. And again, I, having shared that the GIF about uh, Snowflake and, and Databricks and their battles around benchmarks, I know how dangerous showing benchmarks are, but, but this was just too good to share. Now, I do want to say, we did a webinar with SimilarWeb this morning. And we did a webinar with Apps Flyer and Looker a week ago. Uh, go to our website, find these. You can find out all details about these implementations. But essentially, they were using Spark to transform the data and Athena to query it. And Athena just wasn't meeting their needs from a data perspective. And so they replaced the Spark jobs. They load the data into Firebolt. Again, ELT, it's common thread. And they are a Looker customer. And so we have a, a great relationship with Looker. A lot of our Leadership came from Looker, um, and and again this time five to ten x lower cost for them, and they're able to join data sets that are twenty terabytes of data in under a second, and and really just you look at all these queries, you know, going from again one hundred twenty seconds doesn't sound terrible for a data engineer. You're like, hey, that that's normal. I hate to go, but for a business user, that's a lifetime, right? And and the more you can run those queries, then more you can ask the next question. Because as soon as you answer the first question, then there's another question. And, and that's really what's there. So what did we do with Firebolt architecture? How did they build the platform? So they started with table stakes, right? Data Warehouse as a Service is the new standard. Pioneered by Snowflake, everybody's headed there. Separation of storage and compute is essential. Why? Because there's so much data and you don't want to have to scan it all. You don't want to have to redistribute every time you run a query and you can scale up or scale out. We'll talk about that. In fact, we have a unique way. It's funny when Snowflake talks about scaling out or up, I'm sorry, they talk, it's really scaling out, but within a cluster and then scaling out as additional clusters. With Firebolt, you can actually scale up in the individual engine. So, you know, it's funny when I was at Snowflake, uh, we had a couple of salespeople who tried to like tell product, you need to rename a warehouse in Snowflake an engine. And, and it's funny because I never told the guys at Firebolt this story until after I heard that they had named their compute cluster an engine. So it's kind of nice. We got the better name, even though we, were, we came along later. I, I like it much better. So Firebolt engines are, are how you work with data, it's how you load data into Firebolt. Uh, you can query, by the way, you can query data sitting in S3 in Parquet, Orca, Avro, CSV, JSON, or, or JSON, but 
you know, typically you're going to want to bring the data in to get this, the, the performance boost that you get by storing the data in Firebolt. And the main reason why it's so fast in Firebolt is because of our indexes. We're going to talk about that, how we leverage Sparks indexes, aggregating indexes, and join indexes. So that's really what's unique. So, so basically, everything in our system was optimized not for ease of use, not for flexibility, but for speed. And I think that's really the difference. Everybody, you look at everybody, you look at Databricks. Why does Databricks exist? Well, they created Spark and they wanted a better way to deploy Spark for their customers. Okay, Snowflake wanted a better data warehouse, cloud data warehouse, but they wanted it to be more flexible. They were really focused on that flexibility. They weren't necessarily, in fact, one of the founders, Marcin Zukowski, who had created, he actually was the father of vectorized query execution. He wrote his PhD thesis on it. Said if he'd written a patent, uh, he would have been a billionaire 10 years earlier. Now he, he's now a billionaire because of Snowflake. But uh, but anyway, if he'd written a patent instead of a PhD, but now he's a PhD and he's a billionaire. So I guess it worked out for him. So, you know, so these engines are are the way that the data gets ingested. But Marcin said, you know, Snowflake has yet begun to tune their database, but at the end of the day, their file form in and of itself was designed around simplicity and not around speed. Now they've added things like clustering and things like that, but but Firebolt is built so that not only does the data have indexes, but our engines are built specifically to write the data in a way that is effective. And so it, it really comes down to architecture. And as great as the Snowflake architecture is, it's not necessarily designed for speed. And the other thing is, they have one type of compute. And, and with Firebolt, you can have multiple engines, multiple types of engines. We're gonna actually walk through this. I'm gonna create some engines for you. And then at the top of the slide, but at the bottom uh, on, the, on the right is the APIs. That's one of the most important parts. So as you think about data as code and all those pieces, we started with the REST API. We built a JDBC driver. We actually just released, and you can find it on PyPy, our Python SDK built on top of our REST API. And we did implement SQL Alchemy to make it easy for you guys. Uh, obviously, the language of Firebolt is SQL. You can spin up engines in SQL, you can create tables in SQL, and you can run queries, right? So everything's SQL, you're interfacing, and, and you know we've started working with different BI tools. Uh, you know We have Tableau, Looker Down, uh, Superset, and, and Preset, that, that's kind of the company behind Superset. We work with both of them. Pain intelligence, others. Um, we're still working kind of on our data ingestion. We're talking to companies like Five Train and Matillion. Uh, I actually managed those relationships when I was at Snowflake from a from a technical perspective. So, you know, we'll get there. But really, where they started was this speed. And the goal, as with every database since the beginning of time, is to move and scan less data. So uh, I'll share this story, please. You know. If any of your friends with Darren Thane, this is not a knock on Darren. I know Darren well from the time as, as CTO of Domo. I called Darren about six months after I joined Snowflake. I actually didn't initiate. One of our sales guys had reached out to him. And I told him that I told him about Snowflake's architecture. And he, the first thing he said is, we tried to make S3 data storage work, and it didn't. And so he basically just hung up on me at that point. <laughs> he was polite enough about it, but he's like, we're not going to work with you guys. And then, you know, so it took us four more years to get in the door there. Uh, they recently announced the partnership, you know, and, and you know, like I said, nothing against him. He, they had done a lot of work. And, but the key to working with technologies like S3, as great as they are, is to minimize the data that you need to scan and to move as little as possible. You think about Snowflake's query optimizer, it's all about minimizing the data, the partitions, the micro partitions that you have to scan. So we, we started with that same goal. Now, the way we store our data is a little bit different. I'll get into the details there. But, but the idea starts with moving and scanning much less data. You know, we don't want to have to bring in a whole partition, right? So columnar data storage is the first part, right? Obviously, columnar solves some things. And then on top of it, we lay this idea of sparse indexing. So they point to these small ranges of data in the files. And they're much smaller than partitions. And, and really what it does is it allows us to scan data incredibly fast and to get to the data that you want right away. 
And, and, you know, compared to like zone maps and other things, it's very fast. And so we created these, this file format. It, it is its own file format. It's called triple F F3, but really it comes down to three layers of, of data that I'm going to talk about here in a second, but that's really the building block that makes this possible and allows us to scan as little data as possible. So when you create a table in Firebolt, you will create what we call a primary index. And that primary index is going to be based on the columns that you think you're going to query the most often. Now, what's beautiful about this, you never have to vacuum. You create it once, you don't think about it. Firebolt automatically maintains the sort order for you. So how, do, how does this all happen? So you think about this. So on ingestion, we are sorting, compressing, and also what's not mentioned here is encrypting the data. So we create all these little ranges and then we create this index. And you'll notice that not all of the data is kept in S3. And this is the big difference between Snowflake and Firebolt. So Snowflake keeps all of its metadata in its cloud services layer, which is a shared layer. And you don't really have any way to give more resources to your cloud services layer if you have more metadata than somebody else. Right? And so sometimes queries in Snowflake can compile for multiple seconds. Now, I love Snowflake for a lot of reasons, but, but I'm just explaining the difference here. So Firebolt actually connects the storage to the compute in a way while it is separated physically. We bring a lot of the metadata right into the engine. And so we store the index in the engine to give us really fast performance. So rather than the query going into the services layer and getting you know, compiled there, we just send it straight through to the engine. The engine does JIT compiling along with some other things. It optimizes the query, builds a logical query plan, and then builds the physical query plan and then executes it. Now, I'm explaining this all to you guys because you guys are a technical group and you want to hear the nitty gritty details. But for you, you don't, you know, at the end of the day, you're just like, I want a fast query. But I do want to explain it to you. So, so we're pulling this data into SSD and memory. And that's really why we allow you to specify different profiles for your compute, because different queries are going to have different impacts on that memory and storage. When I talk about storage, it's SSD storage in the EC2 nodes that we're running. Now, you'll notice I've only talked about AWS, and that's because today Firebolt only runs on AWS. We obviously have plans to be much bigger. We'll go to Azure and, and Google when it's time, but, but we'll talk about EC2 now. So these EC2 instances have compute, they have memory, and obviously anything in memory is going to be much faster, and then we have a cache. So, so these indexes are constantly being consulted in there. Now, we do store the indexes in S3 because, A, I might have more than one engine and I want to sync the data. And obviously, if I shut down my engine, I don't want to lose anything. So the indexes are all backed up to S3, but they're not, they, they live in the compute nodes so that they run very, very quickly. And so between the cache that already lives in the compute engine, and the ability to get just to the data that you need, Firebolt's very, very fast. So we use push down, you know, we use these exact data ranges. So, you know, if I'm grouping by a particular column or if I'm filtering, I always like to give the example, I have five years worth of history. I only want to look at the last month. If I've got a sparse index on that date column, I can immediately eliminate, you know, four and a half years worth of data. And I don't even have to scan it. It just sits in S3. I don't ever have to do it. So we, we push down the optimization. We, we reorder the query to make, you know, we do as much push down as we can to filter before we join all of that. We have advanced indexes that I'm going to talk about, aggregating indexes that you can actually even bypass using the physical table and use an aggregating index, which is a materialization of the data to make it fast. And, and you've got these pre, those, those indexes are stored in memory. Uh, and in storage so that it's very, very fast because SSD is almost as fast as, as memory in some ways. 
And what's interesting enough is you can see some of our engines, as you're going to see in a minute, are big enough that customers will bring all of their data into the cache so that they're running essentially an SSD data warehouse. Now, depending on your, your data, you know, we'll figure it out. But uh, we're using all of these pieces. We use Vectorize. I talked about Vectorize query optimization. We use that. And, and you know, we, we obviously will at some day write a white paper about what we're doing specifically to do all that optimization. But at the end of the day, it comes down to having the sparse index and other indexes that allow us to get through to, to scan and move as little data as possible. And, and so, you know, what are the other aspects of Firebolt that you want to hear about? So again, we're ANSI compatible. We built a great SQL editor that I'm going to show you here in a minute. We actually built our SQL dialect based on Postgres. It's kind of the industry standard. We wanted to be there because ANSI leaves a lot of things open, date formatting, uh, you know, semi-structured data stuff is in ANSI, but it's not really. Um, you have granular control over compute resources. You can decide what you want to spin up, what you want to spin down. It's programmable through a REST API end to end. And we use Airflow, Airbyte, um, you know, all kinds of op operations to orchestrate the data. Um, you know, we expect customers to use Git. Uh, we're not in Terraform yet. Terraform is one that we want to work on. We think it would be exciting to have, you know, Terraformed uh, Firebolt instances. But again, it's easy to scale. JSON, again, is fast. I still remember I, one of the customers, I walked into a customer in Seattle. So when I joined, or in Chicago, sorry, when I joined Snowflake, I lived in, in uh, Seattle. And the, my sales territory, there were three sales teams in America. And my sales territory went from Detroit to Seattle, across the top. So it covered Salt Lake City. I actually came to Salt Lake as a Snowflake employee a number of times. I uh, did a couple meetups myself, actually bought pizza for a couple of different meetups. Uh, and uh, we'll be happy to sponsor one. I know, you know, uh, you guys start sponsoring some meetups. We'll definitely sponsor when we can get everybody together. But uh, I remember we did a JSON query and it blew this guy's mind that we could load their JSON and run queries. And, and I'll say Firebolt's even faster. Uh, Firebolt is incredibly fast on JSON and, and definitely something you can play around with. Um, the, the, the indexes are always maintained. So it happens on insert. And I think the thing I like to tell people, the thing that blows my mind the most about, about Firebolt is how fast the ingests are given everything that they're doing. They're resorting data. They're you know, recreating all these indexes, and yet we still can outperform solutions like Snowflake at times. And, and really what it's about is high concurrency, low latency workloads at data lake scale, billions of rows, terabytes, even petabytes of data. And that's not just hyperbole. We have customers who are doing it, right? So, so you start with an engine, you have a database and an engine, and and you start you, these engines are all based on EC2 nodes. So we're going to talk about that. I'm going to get into the demo here in just a minute. And again, you can share these engines. You can figure out, hey, a certain engine type is good for a particular data set. And the one thing to note, en across engines, just like in Snowflake warehouses, a workload will not impact other workloads. There is one limitation today we'll talk about in terms of being able to write data. And um, somebody did ask a question, and it was, probably, it was asked uh, not too long ago about non-flat data structures. And I know those are very popular. Uh, non-flat data structures are very popular. And, and to be honest, in Firebolt today, you've got to flatten them to get the performance. And that's what happens with with Snowflake typically is, is, but we do have a way to flatten. We allow you to flatten it, uh, but, but at the end of the day to get the type of performance that we want, it's just too much memory when you're trying to, you know, take a data set that's, that's hierarchical in nature. You don't really know what it's gonna be. It could be a, a ragged hierarchy. It could be any kind of, you know, list of any kind. You, just, you gotta kind of flatten it to get the performance. But, but we definitely can work with you on that. We do have customers that are working with other data sets. 
Um, so again, so those are the engines. And then I want to talk a little bit about these indexes. So we call, you know, our primary indexes sparse indexes because that's kind of how the, how the data goes. Uh, we then have aggregating indexes and joint indexes. I'll talk a little bit about those right before we jump into the demo. So what is a primary index? Obviously, it's a table level index that defines the table sort order. And it is a multi-column thing, and it is in sort order. So in this case, term is going to be sorted first, then view date, and then region key. So what I like to say is you want to have your higher cardinality indexes further down the list. Because let's say I had a, a unique ID as part of my primary index, it's, you know, obviously it's not going to, uh, you know, my data is going to be very much, the, the subsequent sorts are not going to be very effective, right? So, so what is, what is a primary index for? Query filters, number one. Pruning the data, limiting the data. So, you look at your where clause, and your where clause is going to determine your primary index in 90% of cases, right? The other thing that you'll want is for group buys. So if you have some extensive group buys, you're going to want to use that as well. But really, the filter is the key to your primary index. So let's say I have a very low cardinality thing. Let's say I have four terms, right? And I filter by term. Suddenly, I've cut my data in a quarter without having to do really anything at all other than select a quarter. So that's why it's big. And it's part of every table creation state syntax. Now, I will talk about how Firebolt has two types of tables. It has fact and dimension tables. For dimension tables, a primary index is optional. Um, but one thing to note, you can include a function in a primary index. So if you have a date, but you don't want to use the full date, like it's a timestamp and you don't want to use a full timestamp, you can do a function like a two date or a date trunk. And I will say we're actually pretty smart with timestamps. So I would first try it as a timestamp and see how Firebolt handles it. Because it's usually, what we find is you want to group by one, but you want to filter by another and then it creates problems. So just using the date is the easiest way, but you can use functions. You can also use hashes, which could be pretty interesting because obviously text fields are not ideal for any kind of pruning or grouping. I mean, obviously you've got to group by it, you know, text fields. And we'll talk a little bit about why join indexes are so powerful in a minute when it comes to, you know, if you've got a, a star schema and you want to look up a, a label, you know, that, that's good in a join. But, but again, the primary index is there. Now, so here's the thing. When you create it, it cannot be modified. Because the data is stored that way. So and I remember doing this in, in Redshift back in the day. You know, basically what we'll do is we'll do a create table as select, and we'll create a secondary table with a different primary index until we get the right primary index. And then we go back. So, you know, it's faster than reloading the data. I create table as select, and then I set define the primary index in, the, in that statement for the new table and I can try out a couple of different pairings, run some queries, and I see what, what is the most optimal. Now, on the, in contrast to a primary index that is one per table, we have aggregating indexes. And this is, you can have as many aggregating indexes on a table as you want. And in fact, they're, they're much more storage efficient than a materialized view. They also operate on joined queries so if you're joining the fact to dimension tables and all of your aggregations are still in the fact, you can use an aggregating index. The, the optimizer will use an aggregating index even if you joined other tables, which I know Snowflake's implementation of materialized views, that, that's not the case today. So, so you know, it's, it's great if you have common aggregations. And again, we're going to materialize that data. And not only is it going to be materialized, it's going to be loaded into storage on the, the engines so that it runs even faster. And so it is, it is very much an aggregation state. And what happens is, going back to that diagram of the optimizer, it looks, when it sees a query, it checks all the different aggregating indexes, aggregate 
dating indexes for that table, and it gives you the one that makes the most sense for that query, or it just gives you the raw table. And our an explain plan will actually tell you which whether it's using the raw table or whether it's using the aggregating index. And so instead of having to scan the table, it's going to you know use this aggregated data that's already cached, and it's super easy to create one. Create aggregating index. The first part of the statement after that. So you got to give it a unique name. You got to tell it what table it's on. It's on a single table. Then you give it what we call the grouping columns. And it it knows the difference because obviously there's got to be some kind of an aggregation for the aggregation columns. But in this case, we have five grouping columns. So it could be a date, it could be an ID, it could be any number of things. And it's going to group by any of those. So if those are in your where clause or a group by, and you're then pulling out these other values, Firebolt can, can short circuit the query and run much faster. And you can have as many of these as you want. And because they're not fully materialized, it's not going to cost you much in the way of storage. Now, you cannot query them directly. You can't say, hey, like with the materialized view, you can query directly. But an aggregating index is just automatically used when um, when you query that. Um, so somebody mentions it sounds like an instantiated view. It's a lot like it, that. It's also like a projection in Vertica in some ways. Uh, it's pretty cool. Anyway, a lot of customers are using them. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, value there, right? So. Um, it really, and this is a question I do get, right? And I got this when I was at Snowflake. Is a star schema the best schema for Firebolt? I, at Snowflake, I used to say we're data, we're data schema agnostic. I will not say that at, at Firebolt. A, a star schema is going to make sense. Why? Because one thing an aggregating index can't do, it can't join tables in the aggregation. So I have to have all of my facts, my aggregatables in one table. Right. And and really, if I want to join to my dimensions, my foreign keys in that back table are going to be part of my aggregating index. Right. And so it just makes sense that a star schema just fits in and, and it just makes sense. Now, you don't have to do a star schema, even though we call it a fact table. You could put any kind of table. I always say if you don't know what kind of table it is, call it a fact table. We'll figure that one out later. I'll talk a little bit about what a dimension table is in a minute. but but again, this is a way to accelerate your queries. It can never slow down a query. Whereas, you know, the wrong primary index can make a query slower. And a query, you know, again, a primary index that, that speeds up one query will slow down another because they use different uh, filters, they use different aggregations. But an aggregating index will never slow down a query. So definitely, you know, something that you can do. They're easy to create, and you know, really powerful. So join. So in Firebolt, I mentioned we have fact and dimension tables. And the reason is because of something that I we call a, a broadcast join. So in Snowflake, there's just one type of table in all, most databases, right? And, and I know specifically Snowflake's optimizer really well. So if you have a, a table that is smaller and that joins to a large table on, on a key that is a relatively low cardinality, Snowflake will implement what they call a broadcast join, which is it will send the entire dimension table contents to each of the nodes and then join it to a subsection of the fact table. Now, in Firebolt, we do the exact same thing, except you as a, as a DBA or a data engineer have the ability to define what tables you want to be treated as dimension table. So dimension table does not need to have a primary key, it can, a primary index, but what a dimension table will typically have is a join index. Now, uh, what is a join index? So it's created on top of a dimension table and it's saved in memory. So while some indexes may, depending on you know the usage of memory in your engine, some indexes may get pushed out. You know, we kind of start, the, the most important data is in memory, then the next important is in, uh, is in cache, and then S3, and that's why we call F3 actually is because of those three places where the data is stored, is memory, cache, and S3. So a, a join index is always stored in memory. And it 
it has two parts to it. It has key columns and value, like lookups. And what it does is it helps a lot eliminate scans. So let's say I have a great example of this. I have a product table. So I'm selling, I'm, a, I'm an e-commerce, I'm selling data, or I'm selling stuff. And I got data about those sales. And one of the things, one of the attributes of what I sell is products. I sell products. And I have categories of products. Well, there's a lot of information in my product dim, but I, you know, maybe in this case, you know, we've got apps, there's an app slug, which is how we look it up. And then we have a name and a platform. Well, I don't want to have to go look up that name or platform every time because they're very commonly queried. And there's a lot of other data in there that is just not needed, you know, most of the time. And so it eliminates the need to scan. So suddenly you're saying, hey, I want to group the data and the fact by category, but I don't want to have to do the join. So instead of having to do a full join, Firebolt uses the join index to look up the category for the foreign key and automatically join the data very quickly. This can save a ton of compute. It can save memory, which is another piece. And it is an independent object correlated to a dimension table. So fact tables exist in Firebolt. They can have one or more uh, aggregating indexes. Dimension tables also exist, and they can have one or more join indexes. Now, we get asked this question a lot. Can I use a join index? Can I have multiple join indexes? Now, typically, if you're using any kind of conform dimensions or things, you probably don't need, you're probably using the same foreign key for every lookup and you're looking up the same value. So you probably only need one join index. I do want to point out something going back to aggregating indexes. Somebody asked, so, so if I have two or three different ways that I query a table and the primary index only, only suits one of them, can I use an aggregating index as a pseudo primary index? And the answer is yes. So you can give it just a dummy aggregation, like a count of something, count star, and give it the columns that you would use to look up for that second or that third method of looking up data, and, and it will act as essentially a secondary primary index. So again, different ways to use these tools, but those are the tools that you have. So uh, again, you know, this is the way that, that you get the data along with um, that. And so I, I want to open it up real quick to any questions as I, as I fire up the demo here. Uh, any other questions? So interestingly enough, uh, you know, as a SaaS database, uh, we have a, a web UI. And so, uh, you know, you log into Firebolt. Everybody logs into app.firebolt.io. Based on your credentials, you log in and you can see one or more accounts. Now, for most users, you only have one account, right? Here's your release notes, documentation. We do not yet have a free trial, by the way. Um, so if you're really interested, at the end, I'm going to share, a, you know, I shared Todd at Firebolt.io. Feel free to reach out. I, I, I very much am interested in working with people in Utah. I love it here. Uh, made it my home for, for most of the past uh, 30 years. Um, but, but our documentation is available. Now, if you Google search or Firebolt documentation, you will not find it because we do not allow Google to index our stuff because we don't want our competitors necessarily finding it. I will share with you guys that it is docs.firebolt.io. There's a great getting started tutorial, but of course, to, to get started, you need your own instance. Uh, like I said, you would have your own account when you log in at app.firebolt.io. You can actually go there and request an instance. I don't recommend that you do that unless you reach out to me first. Most requests get get denied at this point. We're still essentially in beta. But we have a list of databases here and I can search it. So I've created my own little sandbox. So Todd Sandbox, you can see has two engines. Um, 
and it has a bit of data in it. We'll, we'll talk about that later. But what I want to do is I want to create a new database just for today's meeting. So we're going to call it Utah Data Engineering Database. And it does not like anything other than, because you know it is a database, so we're going to call it that. Now, the first thing I do is I select my region. This is important because the data that I want to load needs to be in the same region. That's a that's a temporary uh, thing that's done for performance reasons and to save you money. We didn't want customers to suddenly run up a huge bill of egress by loading data from a different region. So we tell you, you know, put us in the region you need. If you need a different region, then you know, let us know. I'm going to do this. I'm going to say this is a uh, meetup. And I'm going to pick an icon. This is just for when you have lots of different ones. And I'm going to put my Jeep on here because we're, we're from Utah. Jeeps are a big deal. And you'll notice that it immediately created an engine for me that is called a, that it's given the name of general purpose. And I do want to talk about the difference now between uh, a general purpose engine and a data analytics engine. So physically, there is no difference. Physically, they are exactly the same. The engine spec is going to be def defined here in just a minute, but it is a flag that allows us as a system to know whether or not you intend to write data from this engine. The limitation today is that within a database, and again, you can have many databases, you can only have one active read-write engine at any given point in time. And that's to avoid write contention. Now, I can scale out a write engine so that I can be writing you know, many tables at the same time, and I have no problem with concurrency there, but I can't have two different engines writing to the same table at the same time, or even anywhere in the same database. So that's the first thing to note. So then if I want more engines at the same time, I need to create data analytics engines. Now, I don't want to change the type of the engine that I'm looking at, so I'm going to go ahead and add an engine to this general purpose engine. And what I want to do then is I'm going to give it a name called analytics, because this is going to be the one we're going to run in queries in. And I'm going to make it a data analytics engine, a read-only engine. And I'm going to then pick my spec. So we have four families of compute in Firebolt, of engines. The first is optimized for compute. This is the C5 family. If you're familiar with AWS, you'll notice we use AWS instance names, EC2 instance names. At some point, that'll change. We'll come up with a more generic naming convention, but we will always give you the ability to have multiple types. So, so essentially, we have about 20 plus different instance types. And I kind of say this is a this is a good middle ground between Snowflake that gives you one instance type. It happens to be, by the way, a C5D2X large, as of the last time I checked. Um, and, uh, you know, notice they charge about three times what we do, at least at enterprise level for that same node. But uh, it is, you know, we feel like different compute profiles can really have an impact on the types of queries that you're able to run. And so, but we want to be really upfront about our pricing. So you see right here what it costs. So I can run a, a, a small, and I know at Snowflake, we always, always get asked like, hey, can I do a, a half a warehouse? In fact, Fishtown Analytics, the guys who created DBT and is now rebranded as DBT Labs, they used to ask us that all the time. Hey, we got small customers, they want small. And we say, hey, if you're that small, go to Redshift. Um, but but here we go, you know, with Firebolt, we, we can get you down to 30 cents an hour. And the reason why 30 cents an hour of compute will work with Firebolt is because our indexes are so efficient that you can actually query really fast across decent amounts of data. But obviously, some data sets are going to need more. And they're going to need more of different things, right? Some are going to need more CPU. Some are going to need more RAM. Some are going to need more storage. So we show you at each level what you're getting. So I'm going to pick just to, to pick on Snowflake a little bit, I'm going to pick a C5 do 2, 2x large. And I do want to show the others. So we have optimized for compute. We have optimized for storage. 
Uh, funny story, when Snowflake first started, they actually had i3 nodes. can't remember if they were using the 2x large or what, but but they're using i3 nodes as kind of, a, they called it an enterprise node. Uh, some of their customers were using them even as of a couple years ago uh, because some sometimes you just need extra storage. Now, with Firebolt, this is exciting because now you can tell your data, hey, I want to bring all my data into storage, the SSD cache, and then S3 kind of acts just as a sync between the different engines, right? And, and the engines themselves have all the data and they'll get, every time the data gets updated, updates will get pushed across all the engines so you'll get the latest data. But here you can go up to 14 terabytes a node. And we'll show you in a second how you can have more than one node. So you can have, you know, dozens of terabytes of data in, in here. Now it's gonna cost a good bit. And I get, I get questions like, hey, Fire, I hear Firebolt super cheap and I hear it's super expensive. Well, hey, at 40 cents an hour, it's pretty cheap. At 11.50 an hour, it's probably not super cheap. And especially when you see how many nodes you can add, hey, I, can, I can get up to hundreds of dollars an hour, but you'd be surprised Snowflake in their little benchmark war is talking about five XL warehouses that cost, you know, that are, uh, I think it's uh, a thousand nodes and, um, or no, it's a five five twelve nodes and costs you know an insane amount of money to run. But hey, you know, companies need it. So then the other thing that we see that runs out, especially when you got big joins, is memory. Uh, now you know the AWS doesn't have huge memory. You think, hey, I've got a desktop with you know sixteen or you know with with a terabyte of RAM. Not very common. You know, mine is probably sixteen gig, but I've seen you know huge amounts of RAM out there. But you know seven. 768 gig is pretty big. And again, you can have more than one. So we have optimized for memory. Again, big joins, it's great. And now we have balanced. We kind of said, hey, what are the ones? So you have the balance between Snowflake and then Databricks where you can spin up any EC2 node uh, that they allow. And, you know, but what you can expect in the future, to be honest, is a, a you know, serverless approach, trying to help make it easy. Because at the end of the day, it takes Firebolt some time to spin these up. So here's then the engine scale. And if I drag it, I'm going to get powers of two. There is no magic to powers of two. I know Snowflake only allows powers of two. Here we can go with any number. But I will say that for individual queries, they operate best on a single node today. We are working on some, some shuffling to make that more efficient as you scale out. But you can definitely scale up. But again, scale out. And then scale up is here. Now, warm up method. The reason why this is important is because, like I mentioned, it takes us at least five minutes to start up an engine when you hit go. And we're going to do that here in just a second. And um, the, just doing a quick time check here. Um, the, the less data we load, the less time it takes. So we have minimal means it's it's only going to load the, the the bare minimum of data and minimal is going to spin up in about five minutes preload index is spins up in about seven minutes so it it starts up the instance and then it loads all of the index data including any aggregating indexes into the engine and preload all data then can take a while and again it depends on how much data you have in your in your uh database and and again, if you tell it to preload all data and the database size exceeds your engine, then you know it will it will do its best to figure it out. But down here we have the total engine stats, which is the cost. So this is going to cost us 90 cents an hour to run, and I can leave that always on so that I have to manually turn it on, turn it off. Now Snowflake always kind of says, "Hey, don't don't ever do that." We're like we have customers that leave it on because it does take five minutes to spin up. We do have customers leaving it on. We give you defaults of 20 in an hour. An hour is kind of a popular one. And then we have custom, you can pick any any time you want. Um, up to you know hours and hours. Um, we're gonna stick with an hour here. So again, that's any time where it goes an hour without getting any query, it's gonna shut itself down. Most of our customers find because we have less expensive compute options that they're able to run 24 seven on Firebolt because they never wanna lose their cash and they don't want to have to wait for the five minutes to spin up, but they still save money versus Snowflake that's scaling up and scaling down. Now you may ask about auto scaling. 
something we're looking into doing very soon. One that we're going to do in the very short term is we're going to make it so you can edit a, a warehouse that's running because one thing you will note is that you cannot edit a running warehouse. And so if we want to make any edits, we have to change it. So I'm going to go ahead and start the general purpose engine because we're going to need that to load any data. So while we're waiting here, and again, you know, I, I see my, my entry here as a database and, and I could have multiple databases. I'm going to go um, into take walk you guys through the SQL workspace. So we have built into our UI a very flexible and powerful SQL workspace. Now, uh, we can pick any database. You'll notice that this AdTech DB is our, is our demo database, the data set. We're actually going to load the same data set. You'll notice that this engine is on. When the engine is on, it's going to show you the list of tables including both tables, external tables and views. I'm going to talk about external tables in just a minute. If I click on any of these tables, it's going to show me the columns here. As I go into the, the window here, I'm going to get type ahead. So I can build a, a query very quickly. And as I go in, it's going to start listing my tables. So I'm going to go just do a select count star from LTV and it's going to give me the number or I can do something else like show tables, right? But I have to have a running engine in order to do any of this, right? To list the tables. Notice you can have scripts. So scripts can be saved, shared. You know, definitely what you're gonna see over time is you're gonna see us using, you know, like a GitHub type approach where you can save scripts, you can version scripts, all that. But just to know, before you can do anything, you have to do that. So if I come in here and I want to find our Utah Data Engineering database, you'll notice that it says, hey, I don't have an engine. I don't have anything. And in fact, waiting for my general purpose engine to start up. So our SQL syntax is pretty standard. Um, you know, and while we're waiting for that to start up, I'm going to jump back into the ad tech so we can see things. A couple of things to note. So I get my results. I can, uh, you know, drill in on those, see the different stats, show me the values um, for each of these. I can sort them, I can interact with it, but really I want to understand, you know, what goes into some of these queries. Um, and, you know, again, we do have full support for information schema. So if I wanted to do that, that's basically doing a show table. So one thing you'll note here, is that we have we're, we see this key continual mention of internal versus external tables. So I want to talk a little bit about how to get data into Firebolt. So if I've got data sitting out in S3, and today it's only available for data that's sitting in S3, I'm going to need to create an external table for that data. So I'm a big BB Edit guy. I have my script. So create external table. Now, if I'm using Parquet, I'm going to need my my tables are going to need to match, right? My columns are going to need to match. The, obviously, the Parquet doesn't have you know column headers where there's a name, but the types are going to need to match, or at least be compatible. So I'm going to define all of the columns in my table. I'm also going to define a location. Along with that, by the way, I will also include credentials. In this case, we've made the data available, so I don't need to do credentials. You can either do a secret and secret key, or I can do a ARN for a role. Most of our customers are using roles. I then have an object pattern, because not maybe not every file in that bucket is going to want to be loaded. And then we have types. As I mentioned earlier, we support Parquet, Orc, JSON, Avro, and uh, CSV. The CSV today, I'll be honest, is pretty limited. Uh, by default, it's comma separated. There's some ways to use different delimiters, but uh, you know that's that's kind of what it is. Notice in here, you know, standard syntax. We run this so we can run this over and over again. We drop the table. So you create this table. Once this external table is created, you can query it at any time. So I'm going to bring this in here. 
we're going to jump back to our database that we want to work with here. So again, it's easiest to filter it. So get Utah Data Engineering. And our, our, our engine is running. So we're going to go ahead and run this create external table if not exists. And it worked. It is very fast because it didn't actually do anything. So now, if I refresh my tables, I see ex account external as things. So if I do select count from count external, I can query it. I could query whatever. So in this table, there's only 72,000 records, pretty, pretty small table. So now I'm like, hey, I can query this, you know, I can do select, you know, if I look at the, the columns, I can I can do any kind of a select here. Um, and, you know, it's pretty, pretty flexible stuff. And, um, you know, so if I were to say, hey, I want to get like select uh, website. So jump back here. I can spell correctly. Now notice it, it doesn't know the column name. So I mean that wasn't slow, right? I mean seventy two thousand. It's querying out a parquet, it's super easy. You know, like so I can run any query I want, but the query that I want to run, first I want to create an, an internal table. So the next thing is to create a, a dimension table for that. And so we're gonna go ahead and So we're going to just replace that, create a dimension table, and it has a primary index. And um, there's a little keyword in here about accelerating join left. And it created, obviously, it hasn't done any data. There's no data in that table yet. So how we're going to get data into the table then is running an insert statement. So it's basically going to be, in this case, a very simple insert statement. Now you'll notice I added to, there are two columns you may not have seen it because there are two columns in my uh, in my dimension table that are not in the source table, in the, the, the external table, which are source file name and file timestamp. So those are keywords that we can reference. So we're going to do a select star from account, external, and we're going to add these two columns, and we're going to just insert that into account. So we're going to run that, and again, this is going to do, this is the first one that's really running any data, and it's going to take us a couple of seconds. Seconds here. Now, this is going to vary based on the size of your engine. Sorry, the size of your engine, and parallelism when coming to loads is very is leveraged heavily. So when you talk about you know a load database, and I can come back over here and look at it. Um, you know, I can hover over um, my when I hover here, you see over here that it, it's a two x two, so it's got two nodes in my general purpose engine, and I can jump back and forth. Um, so again, we're we're now loading data into that table, so now I can do. So now I say account, and I can see, actually, it should be done. It's just, it's wrapping up. This is where, you know, it's inserted all the data. It's still kind of doing some wrap up. But typically, it, you know, it's it's pretty quick on those inserts. So uh, in, the, in the instance of, you know, let's go ahead and run down here. So we've done the account table. I'm going to grab the rest of this down to a certain point, I'm going to load it, go ahead and load all of my tables here. And notice we do create an aggregating index. We're going to talk about that here before we're done. We're just going to go ahead and run all of this script. 
And you'll notice, you know, just like almost any system, it's going to tell you what's successful, what's running. Uh, if it failed, it'll tell you what the error is. And again, when, when we go to do these, so we're creating a couple of dimension tables, and then we're creating a much larger table. Now you'll notice we create two versions of the owned apps table. In fact, I'm going to drag this down, and we're going to look at exactly what we did. So we created owned apps, and then we created owned apps with join index. And so we create this join index. And this is as easy, you know, this is actually what we showed you earlier. We're taping the app slug, which is part of the primary index. And we're looking up name and platform uh, based on that. So the app slug is how it's going to join then to the, and actually they don't join to the same name. So it actually app slug joins to app ID which is you know the the join that we're going to set up um but that is you know essentially how it, how it operates so you can create those indexes and you'll notice we're creating the indexes before we insert the data it doesn't have to be in that order you can do it in different orders um this one's actually going to run for a minute so we're going to go do some other things while while we wait for this to run cuz it's loading uh 30 billion rows so it's, it's loading 30 plus billion rows into the LTV table. So I'm actually going to jump back over to, while that's loading, I'm going to jump over to the ad tech. And I want to show you guys then what this looks like in Looker. So Looker is a, is a partner. Obviously, we don't necessarily uh, recommend one over the other. You'll notice how quickly that, that refresh. Now, the easiest way to say this media source is one of the columns. Um, by removing this, we're actually increasing the data set significantly. So you see here, we have 600 million impressions. When I do that and then hit update is what fires off. So I make the change. So we went to 6 billion impressions and it refreshed that quickly. So we 10X our data size and it still works that quickly. Now, when I jump back into here, we have a very nice feature called query history. And I'm going to do this real quick. I'm going to throw it in. I'm just going to look at the last 100 queries that I've run in this database. And actually, I want to do order. Got to type in here. Order by. And time desk. And I still want the limit 100 because I don't want to bring it all back. Um, hold on. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's uh, sorry. Let me look at this real quick. I forget that we got to get it. has to be, um, case, it's case sensitive for this particular, so yeah, I have to do. Not, this is actually, I'd say this is an older account that needs the case sensitivity, but. Um, so we can see here, one thing we could do is we could filter by duration. You can see these queries where they're running what's being run by Looker. Looker likes to throw a little marker in there to tell us what it is. And one of the beauty, beautiful things about our um, SQL editor that I just found out is that when you type format SQL, it does a really nice job of taking you know ugly SQL and formatting it. So you can see here what's being generated by Looker. Uh, they love to do coalesces around sums. I, I've noticed that. But, uh, you know, we've got this data. We're doing joins on the owned apps based on the, you know, the app ID equals the slug. So we're, we, this is not even engaging the, uh, the index that we created. So um, a very, very powerful uh, way to interact with the data. 
I have to credit this data came from Mousefire. It's been completely anonymized, so it doesn't have any of their data in it. But this is the data that we're loading here. So, and again, we're loading 30 billion rows, and it takes us, it's going to take about seven minutes, I think, to load that data. Um, so we'll keep checking in on that. But uh, that is Firebolt. Uh, definitely, you know, looking at ways you can accelerate the data. I'll just to give you a quick peek at the uh, aggregating index that we create here. So this is one of the more complex. You know, it has six lookup columns. It does sums, count distincts, and then even a some case when it can do. So it's, you know, it, it's flexible enough that you can do any of that and, and get the, you know, get what you need out of it. Uh, do we have any, any questions at this point? Well, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, what questions do people have? It's, uh, I think it's an exciting new technology. I've been hearing a ton about it. Um, who else had heard of Firebolt before this uh, talk tonight? I think I was receiving some emails from them back in February. Cool. I'd seen some talk about it on the, the, data, in, <clears throat> the data engineering subreddit. Uh, Todd, I do have a question. Is Google Cloud supported yet? Not yet. Uh, given our relationship with Looker and, and kind of that, uh, I would expect Google, I actually think Google Cloud will be before um, Azure. But, you know, it's interesting. I was very involved at Snowflake with the decision to go to Azure before Google Cloud. And a lot did have to do with the CEO being, you know, very familiar with <laughs> with Microsoft and, and that. But, uh, you know, I, I actually see Google Cloud as kind of the next one that we'll probably attack. What we wanted to do is get the product right before we start going to multiple clouds. Makes sense. I guess on that note, how would you um, compare or contrast uh, Firebolt against something like BigQuery? So really, you know, BigQuery is almost the ultimate black box, right? There's, there's a few things you can do to tune it. Um, We've actually had a lot of our team, in addition to the Looker people, we, we've actually hired quite a few Google uh, engineers. Our CTO was one of the top engineers on BigQuery and brought a, a number of his team members with him. And, and really, that, that's what, you know, I think BigQuery, when you look at the time, and again, BigQuery has evolved a lot into you know, more of a data warehouse than it was when it first started. But, um, you know, Snowflake was really focused on ease of use. BigQuery was, hey, it's simple, it's easy. Now we're saying, hey, there are data problems that you just, that are physic, physics problems that you can't solve without indexes. And, you know, having the flexibility to say, hey, I wanna use a huge amount of compute for this query, even though, you know, the system may not guess that it's a huge query. And so I think with, with BigQuery, you have a lot finer grain control over your compute. And obviously the, the index is, you know, compared to Snowflake, it's really, you know, Snowflake does have the same type of compute, you know, control of spin up and spin down. But obviously, you know, we have, you have specifically tailored compute. And again, indexes make a huge difference in terms of the amount of data we have to scan. I have a question here. I, who would you say Firebolt's, um... Uh, what type of company would, would benefit from something like Firebolt, like small startups, uh, mid-sized companies? Is there a um, certain company where it might be more appropriate than others? So, so I think in the long run, I think we'll, we'll fit it to everybody. I think small, small startups are kind of where we're beginning, right? Well, and I mean, uh, you know, um, some of our current customers are pretty large. Similar web's a big, big customer. Um, We've been working with some large gaming companies, but I think any company that has that need for very fast queries, I know, I, I mean, I was meeting with a customer here in Utah back when I worked for Snowflake and they had a use case that was right here and they were doing something with Redis on top of Snowflake and, you know, it's, it's cool. It, it, it's, it's a way to go, but, you know, at the end of the day, people want to be able to query the data, not a, while we use caching for certain things, they don't want to get, you know, always be hitting a cache version. And, you know, 
Snowflake answers typically scale up, you know, double your compute size and your query run faster. And so we want to give kind of more options for that. So, you know, we're still early phase. So, you know, we do have our SOC 2 type 2, but we're we're not in. There's a question to, to Matt's question about AWS GovCloud. We're not there yet. Uh, we won't be there for, for a while. We won't be able to do FedRAMP or any of that for a year or two. I mean, that's very typical of, you know, same chart we were same path we were on at snowflake but uh you know I, I think it is really companies that are data centric and, and to be honest a lot of companies are using snowflake and firebolt so i'll give an example of a, of a financial services company that they're not a traditional financial services so they don't have some of the requirements regulatory requirements and they've been using snowflake they're happy with snowflake they have a looker dashboard that takes 50 seconds to render so they said hey can you guys do it and now we've got it rendering in under 10 seconds and like the queries are running sub seconds, so the, most of the latency is actually on the looker end. So it's you know a lot of customers that that have that one pain point, that one painful use case, where you know the, their users are telling them that they just need it, they need it to be faster. But you know you reach out to me. Um, the one thing I wanted to, the last thing I'll share here is just to bring back up and to thank you guys for your time. I really appreciate it. I know <laughs> how hard it can be to get a, you know, get, make time. Uh, reach out to me, uh, Todd at Firebolt.io. I'm on Twitter at, at Todd Boshane or LinkedIn. It's pretty easy to find me, um, you know, and I'm, I'm happy to share it with you guys, whether it's just for, you know, personal understanding or um if you're you know your employers have a need or if as a consultant if you're you know working with customers that may benefit from fireball awesome thanks a ton todd it's been really helpful it's been cool i'll stop recording thanks again